the recall. Uh, they used that as one of their primary leading arguments when they were collecting signatures. But the problem, which I would not have had a problem with, if they were telling the truth, even on the petition. So some of the things that you said actually uh, represents some of the misinformation that was included on that petition, which I can totally understand how it could be kind of misleading and give you the wrong perception of what my actual argument was. So with regards to the Ross camp, I'm on record with saying that there were problems at the Ross camp. There were health and safety issues, there were fire issues, there were crime issues, and there were drug use issues. So the statement on the recall petition that says that I quote said that there were no health and safety violations in a declaration to the court when I submitted my official declaration is incorrect. And I would encourage you, if you don't believe me for whatever reason, to go and look at my declaration because it specifically says that there were no imminent or unmanageable risks to health and safety. And I said that because when I came into office, outside of renters' protections, which was one of the first things that we addressed uh, in the second meeting of January, and that was actually, just for the record, was the first time that this group that is now Santa Cruz United used the recall as a political weapon. They wrote to the city council and said that if you pass renters' protections or anything that even resembles just cause eviction, that we're gonna use a recall and a referendum to remove you from office. So. That really struck me because uh, being a new person in office, to have a group of people threaten me, essentially, if I vote for or support a policy they disagree with was very troubling just to begin with. But immediately after that, and even during that process, I was working with advocates and people that were currently experiencing homelessness to try and craft a multi-point plan to address issues like the Ross Camp, because the Ross Camp started forming in November-ish of 2018. So by the time I got into office and was able to actually start making moves as far as policy goes, that was the end of January to the beginning of February. So it had already uh, compounded on itself and become a far too dense location with uh, people living in the mud. Uh, there's the piece that I wrote, which is what the mayor cited as bullying, which was, it's called a fierce urgency of now. And it's on my Facebook page, and that was in reference to Dr. King and his quote that encompasses that phrase. And in that piece, I have pictures and uh, essentially a, a description of what I saw when I went to the camp. Uh, people with wounds on their legs that were just completely un untended to. Uh, people living in the mud, no access to food. I went down there to distribute food, which is how I engaged with people that first time to get an idea of what was going on. And then I came forward with this packet which is now called the homelessness motion if you read about it in papers and everything. But it was a multi-point plan that addressed not only the issues of the Ross camp by advocating for what's called transitional encampments. And uh, for those that aren't, don't know or are unfamiliar with the term, transitional encampments are data-driven uh, spaces, essentially, or data-driven tools to provide a safe emergency place for people to sleep so they're not sleeping out in the woods or under bridges or on the side of roads being criminalized by police but also incorporates a very intentional structure that makes it so that there's no drug, alcohol, sexual activity, minors, or any of these other kinds of things that could be allowed in the camp at all. That provides multiple uh, benefits. One is it creates a safer space for people to be able to sleep and exist. It also makes it so that those compounding issues that you spoke about with neighborhood crime and impact of businesses almost are non-existent because in the implementation of the transitional encampments comes intentional community engagement and regular meetings with the surrounding neighbors so that not only does it create a sense of community between the two groups, but it allows for the neighbors to have an open line of communication with the nonprofit managing the space and uh, facilitate corrections if there are undue impacts to the surrounding community. The other benefit to them in the model that I was advocating for is it required sweat equity of the people that participated. So any resident of the camp was required to contribute 10 hours of their time every week or month, depending on the structure of the camp, in volunteer roles. Because I, there's that saying out there that if someone gives you something for free, then you don't care about it. But if you work for something, then you have ownership over it and you want to protect it. And that's the same concept of that sweat equity is that if someone is participating, not in a paternalistic role where people are being paid to supervise them, but where they're an active part of the community, picking up trash, volunteering at the front gate, cleaning the bathrooms, doing these other kinds of things, then not only does it give them that sense of ownership, but when they see other people breaking the rules, they will step in to stop them because they don't want 
for that to jeopardize what they're helping to build. Unfortunately, as Councilmember Crone mentioned, the implementation of that plan and the implementation of the identification of locations was flawed. I was a new council member when I came in, and in making the suggestion of the city to identify potential locations for the implementation of these transitional encampments, they did not participate in the necessary public outreach. And even when we gave the direction to say, move on Depot Park, there was no intentional staff-driven outreach process to that neighborhood to make sure that there was engagement. It was my fault for assuming that that would take place because there have been people in the city uh, government far longer than I have been, and I'm not a politician. So I was assuming that the staff, knowing the reaction from the community over decades of uh, trying to address the issue of homelessness, would proactively engage and have those conversations. So I accept full responsibility uh, for not spelling out in very specific direction to implement that strategy when I made the proposal. But to get back to the Ross Camp, because that kind of gives you an idea of what I was advocating for and trying to achieve with the Ross Camp, is that I went and met every week with the people that live there. Every week, standing meeting, three o'clock on a Monday, I would go down to the camp and anyone that wanted to come and talk to me could come and engage around the situations they were dealing with and the problems that they were having, as well as the solutions they wanted to see implemented. Uh, there was a group that called themselves the Ross Camp Council. They were kind of self-identified as the leaders of the group, but they were people that had influence over the rest of the people in the camp and were able to implement things. Uh, the number one thing I heard from the women in the camp was that they felt safer there. Now, whether or not it was a safe place, they felt safer there because of the uh, reduction that they felt that they were exposed to sexual and physical violence while they were there. Um, as well as the sense of community. There were many times when people said that there were domestic situations where a husband was getting rough with, uh, a, or a male partner was getting rough with a female partner, and other male residents of the camp would step in and stop that situation from happening, which is not what would happen if they were alone in the woods, or if a woman was sleeping under a bridge and had no one there to observe what was going on. Um, I think there's, a, uh, there's this claim it's a, it's, a, it's a popular narrative online that I, for some, some reason, even though I was born and raised here, ran for office, run nonprofits, and work with people that are trying to make the community better, somehow want to support open air drug dens, and that I'm friends with all the heroin dealers, and somehow I'm getting a cut of all of the money that they're making on selling heroin to people, or all of these other really crazy claims. But it's easy to project on me, one, because I used to be a photographer in an atmosphere where there was drug use, 100%. Um, I was also arrested once for a drug crime. Now, the, the, the record of that is problematic because I was poor, I was not selling drugs, I was in a place where there was drugs being used, it was a large event, a huge concert, and because I had a public defender, they told me don't challenge it and take a plea deal. Even though there was no evidence to support their claims, they told me to take a plea deal. And because I was poor, and they said that if it went to a jury, they were gonna to try to make a point and I would lose, then I took the plea deal and then got that on my record. Now, the, office, or the proponents of the recall now wave that around and say, look, he was arrested once for drug use, he must be a drug dealer, and that's the reason why he's supporting the camp, because he wants to make money off of drugs. And this kind of feeds into the next question, but that's incredibly painful for me for a variety of reasons, um, especially because I have never sold drugs in my life. Um, and it, it's, it, it's really hard to, especially people that have never met me before or don't know me, that they come up with these uh, assumptions about my character because of things that people online who have never met me said. Uh, and along with that claim about the petition gatherers, there are recorded statements of people making completely fallacious claims about myself, my character, my actions, and that's been really consistent through this entire process. So just to end this question, um, which I hope I brought some context for, is that I did not support the Ross camp. I supported what the Ross camp could be with intentional retrofitting and reformation of the structure, and that's what my votes were time and time again, was not to close the camp, but to move people temporarily, clean up the space, and then allow them to come back again with structure. It was only, and, and only 
would I be willing to close the camp if there was adequate shelter? And that brings us to the federal court case, because that's another claim on the recall petition, is that I, I testified against the city in court, which is true. Yeah. I totally did. I was asked by the people and the residents of the Ross camp who understood my arguments and what I was trying to do to come and testify in federal court in San Jose. And when I was there, my statements were exactly the same. Look, there are problems, but we can fix them without displacing these people because we don't have shelter. Now, the city representatives came to court that the, those two days we were there, and they swore up and down under federal oath that we had enough shelter space to be able to close the camp, which the judge eventually bought that story, and we closed the camp. We did not have enough shelter. In fact, we put people in hotel rooms guaranteeing them five days, but we gave them two-day vouchers on a Friday. So their vouchers ended on a Sunday, and they couldn't get in touch with the city to get any more vouchers. So I was receiving phone calls on my personal cell phone from people that were being kicked out of hotel rooms with nowhere else to go because we didn't have ample shelter because we closed the Ross camp and there was nowhere else for them to be. So it's a big issue. There's a lot of moving pieces that go into it, but if you understand the timeline and the approach that I've tried to take since the very beginning when getting into office, it, watch the tapes of city council meetings, listen to my arguments, read the pieces I put out online. Um, I'm not trying to turn Santa Cruz into one giant homeless camp. I'm trying to make it so that people that are experiencing homelessness have safe places to go. People that are housed have the relief of not having to have people sleep in their, in their neighborhoods or in their front lawns because there's a place for them to go. And for business owners, they won't be in your doorways when you go to open up in the morning because they have somewhere to be. They don't want to be in your doorway. They don't want to poop and pee in your doorway. I mean, I'm not sure if that's a problem that you're having, but I hear that consistently from business owners of them having to come early in the morning and shoot people away. And that's solely because of the failure of policy that we've had in the city for a generation, if not longer, uh, that has resulted in all these people being and having nowhere to go, um, as well as lack of rental protections. Now, I'll do this last one really quick, because um, I know I took a lot of time. I hope I provided context for people to understand where I'm coming from, though. Um, Self-care.